In Bell Hooks' discussion, uh, and just in case you didn't know, Bell Hooks prefers that her name be written in lowercase, so it's going to be written that way throughout the lecture notes. So in Bell Hooks' Feminism, a Movement to End Sexist Oppression, we see her criticizing this idea that feminism is just about equality. So the common view is that feminism really just is a movement that demands equality between men and women. And one of her main criticisms is that it's not clear which men women want to be equal to, and it's not clear from whose perspective, um, which kind of woman's perspective we're coming from when we advocate for this. Because if you're coming from if you're coming from the perspective of a black woman, you might not be advocating or wanting to become the equal of a black man. Um, people from uh, the perspective of a lower class or from a non-white perspective, they might not think that starting from equality is the best approach. Instead, uh, feminism should really start from questions about domination. And there's a nice passage here that I'm going to switch to. So she clarifies this a bit more here on this section. I think it's on the third page of the PDF. Whatever the organization, the location, or the ethnic composition of the group, all women's liberation organizations have had one thing in common. They all came together based on a biological and sociological fact rather than on a body of ideas. Women came together in the women's liberation movement on the basis that we were women and all women are subject to male domination. We saw all women as being our allies and all men as being our oppressors. We never questioned the extent to which American women accept the same materialistic and individualistic values as American men. We did not stop to think that American women are just as reluctant as American men to struggle for a new society based on new values of mutual respect, cooperation, and social responsibility. So she says, it's evident that many women active in feminist movements were interested in reform as just an end in itself, and not as a stage in the progression towards some revolutionary transformation. And she's going to argue that this is what we really need as feminists. Feminists should be, or feminism should be reoriented away from just a piecemeal reform approach and towards radical um, politics of ending uh, sexist-based oppression. So she points out that there are a series of reforms that would actually be quite nice. So I've re, um, written them here, and um, there's 13, and I'll just go right through them. Um, there's the elimination of violence in the home and the development of shelters for battered women. We could advocate for support for women's businesses, provide solutions to child abuse, provide federally funded non-sexist child care, uh, change our economic policy to a policy of full employment, uh, offer protection of homemakers so marriage is a partnership, provide an end to sexist portrayals of women in the media, defend uh, reproductive freedom and provide an end to involuntary sterilization, remedy double discrimination against minority women, Revise the criminal codes that deal with rape. Eliminate discrimination on the basis of sexual preference. Establish a non-sexist education system. And provide an examination of all welfare reform proposals for their impact on women. So Hook says, like, look, these things would be fine. They're good goals to have. But there's no demand here, she thinks, of eradicating domination. There's no emphasis on domination here. And so she thinks there's a failure to recognize that even to achieve many of these goals would really require a radical restructuring from the contemporary systems that we're used to. So um, an example would be capitalist structures of economics, imperialist structures of foreign policy, uh, and kind of uh, domestic colonial structures, um, structures of white supremacy, and so on. So she warns that if you want to approach some of these things piecemeal, capitalism might actually accommodate some of them. So perhaps marriage reform could be accommodated within a capitalist system. 
But if we still have this capitalist structure, many women would be um, who are divorced would still be in a, in a position where they could be exploited by uh, the labor market um, by virtue of the economic structures that we have. So her idea is going to be advocating for an end to sex oppression. We'll talk about that here. Um, but she also thinks that this failure to adopt a critical or radical approach to politics is why, in part, there's been little support for feminism or why feminism is sometimes construed as a bad, um, a bad word. So she says, look, the liberal bent of much of feminism actually ostracizes communities of color who have little interest in furthering liberal capitalist agendas and systems, which many might fear is behind the kind of liberal feminist, white feminist reform uh, proposals. So she's going to say this partly explains why many or some women just try to avoid the term feminism, though they might even upon further consideration or in different couched in different terms actually support many of its aims. Um, or even many of the goals that it has, but they fear that the, the motivation is too, um, too bent towards the status quo. Other reasons to reject feminism can include its association with lesbianism. So some people might um, be homophobic and think that if I adopt a feminist perspective or advance feminist goals, that I will be labeled a, a lesbian or I will be labeled gay, and then I will be ostracized from my community. And so there's maybe a fear there. Some might actually recognize white feminism or the dominant views of feminism at the time as being uh, racist in many ways. And we've talked about that already to some extent. Some people actually think differently. They just don't want to be seen as too radical or political. And that might actually be a motivation behind the slogan where we hear that feminism is largely about uh, equality between men and women, because that seems much less radical than toppling racist structures or toppling oppressive economic systems. Hooks's main kind of conclusion from this discussion is that we just don't have a good definition of feminism. Uh, that is part of the problem. It's hard for people to have in their idea or in, in their mind an idea of what the feminist struggle is all about. And so she advocates her own conception of um, feminism as a struggle to end sexist oppression. And at this point, we might not be clear on what oppression means here, but the next or following uh, considerations or, or videos or lectures and readings, um, that gives us a better idea of what we mean or what we might mean by sexist oppression. She wants to argue that feminism is necessarily a struggle to eradicate the ideology of domination that permits, sorry, permeates in Western culture on various levels, as well as uh, it's a commitment to reorganizing society so that the self-development of people can take precedence over uh, imperialism, economic expansion, and material desires of, say, a capitalist, uh, imperialist, or colonial perspective that is um, germane to the United States. So this demands each participant acquire a critical political consciousness based on certain crucial fun fundamental ideas and beliefs about um, uh, domination, the structures that we live in, and um, the kind of human dignity that is owed to each. So there are a couple more points that she brings up here that are a little bit more maybe inside baseball for um, feminist concerns, but I think that they're worth considering. Um, I was actually just having a conversation with my wife about this, about the idea or the competing interpretations of uh, the personal is political. So this is a common slogan in feminist circles, and we've already seen a uh, discussion with Crenshaw about the importance of the distinction between public and private that's been at play in Western political theory and then reinterpreted or criticized in feminist circles. Um, so this might be another way in which feminists push back on this idea that there's a domain of the political, sorry, a domain of the personal in which the political just does not enter into. One idea, and the idea that Hook seems to support, is this idea that, look, when we say the personal is political, we say that there is no 
that that this idea that there is a personal sphere which is untouched by politics is it's a farce it's it's not real um women in particular our everyday reality is informed and shaped by politics and it is necessarily thoroughly political from what we can do with our body with who we can be a partner with how we comport ourselves in public and so on this is all thoroughly influenced by the kinds of policies that are promoted the kinds of political structures that um, push us one place as opposed to another uh, so that's one way of interpreting the personal as political and hooks criticizes what she takes to be the interpretation that garnered mainstream acceptance so the other one is that one's own experience of discrimination or exploitation or oppression automatically corresponds with an understanding of the ideological and institutional apparatus that shapes one's social status and you know we could push back a little bit on hooks here and say that there actually is something um, and we'll see this more with uh, our discussion of standpoint epistemology that if you want to know about discrimination and exploitation or oppression you should look to the experience, experiences and perspectives of those who are discriminated against, exploited, and oppressed. That, in fact, those people have a greater insight into what these co concepts mean or how they play out uh, than a person who is privileged or not discriminated against, not exploited, or not oppressed. Um, but, you know, Hooks might be right in the sense that we could take this a little too far, which is, and I think like they're, her criticism here is maybe less on the insight that one gets and more criticism of just because you feel the effects of oppression doesn't necessarily know, mean that you have a good political platform or structure with which to fight it or you don't know uh, the critical you don't have the critical tools with which to diagnose why you're feeling the oppression or why you're subject to the oppression or exploitation or discrimination. You don't necessarily have automatic insight into these institutional apparatuses. And I think that this is kind of a, a good point in response to some of the um, conceptions of feminism that did not incorporate intersectional concerns. So a white woman might, for example, think that um, her experience of oppression provides an automatic insight into what it's like to be oppressed as a woman. And then she might think that, well, that's it. That's all I need to do. Hooks's response is to say, look, sharing your own experiences and drawing from them of discrimination and et cetera, that's just, that's one aspect of this. Um, one's own experience though, is not synonymous with developing a critical political consciousness. So you need to not only see uh, your own experience or your own perspective, but you have to also develop a certain critical political uh, stance. And in the context of her criticism of kind of capitalism in general here, uh, she, I think, recognizes, she makes comments um, similarly in the context of women's separatist movements. But this, this is part and parcel of this idea that if you cultivate self-understanding or you cultivate uh, personal growth, then you are doing a great deal of work for a political movement. Um, and to some extent that there, there's something right about this, right? So some people suggest that self-care is a revolutionary act when you're in a context in which your body or who you are is not valued or is oppressed or um, the goal of the structures that you live in are to make you feel bad and be weak and be incapable. So there might be some truth to that. However, just sharing personal experience or just doing these things, just having personal growth is not going to be liberatory uh, in, in the kind of larger structural sense. Um, it doesn't fight against um, structural oppression in at least the way that I think Hooks is trying to get at. And I'll skip ahead to uh, the separatist comments here because it's relevant at this point. So if you're not familiar, there uh, was quite a bit of movement on women separatist groups. Sometimes they were lesbian separatist groups. But the idea is that women have always been in the context of patriarchy and have been fashioned and molded under that social structure. 
So this might ring bells of um, the first section of the course of talking about uh, how one is made a woman. And so if we really want to know what women would be like free from those patriarchal structures, then we need to live and cultivate senses of self in spaces where there are no men, spaces in which women are free from certain patriarchal pressures. So the idea here is that women's freedom from sexist domination can only be met in a society made solely of women. So there were quite a bit of people, um, quite a bit of women that went into separatist uh, compounds or circumstances and tried to achieve this. Hooks criticizes this in much the way that I just criticized this uh, conception of self-expression of oppression and so on as being um, the sole route to uh, ending oppression or achieving feminist goals. She criticizes it because it seems that these, these people were largely thinking of feminism as an identity or a lifestyle rather than a political movement geared towards liberation from oppression. So most separatists, she notes, were middle class, they were unmarried, they were college educated, and they're disconnected then from the backgrounds of the working class, the poor, laborers, homemakers, parents, etc. Uh, so what she says is that uh, this resulted in people feeling like that they had some kind of action or were engaging in feminist praxis, but they weren't actually having any kind of radical transformative impact on society. Certainly not for people that couldn't just leave or escape certain kinds of, um, uh, couldn't leave or escape their, their, their current circumstances. It's a bit much to ask people to say, leave their children. No, instead we have to do something else. Now she does say that le lesbian separatists actually had different reasons for separatism. Uh, largely because of the amount of prejudice and discrimination against lesbian women, that there is a really no way um, or very limited ways for women to freely be able to express their love for one another um, without having some kind of separatist ex um, experience. So what does she actually want out of feminism? Well, she says that, look, we shouldn't start from the approach that the men are, men are the enemy, or we shouldn't start thinking of women in contrast to men, we should instead start thinking or start from the diversity of women's social and political reality. We should then centralize the experience of all women. And this is going to require us to examine systems of domination and understand our role in their perpetuation. Uh, so she says we have to start from a very intersectional perspective when it comes to thinking about the goals of feminism. So whereas liberal conceptions of feminism uh, are largely consistent with, say, predominant aims of Western society, imperialism, capitalism, etc., they are consistent with this idea that the individual good is more important than the collective. Um, she wants to say, no, we should instead emphasize feminism as dismantling these kinds of structures. We should think of feminism as something we advocate for not just something as a certain identity that we adopt. Doing this will allow us to be um, uh, black women, well, not, not me, obviously, but black women and advocate for feminism while also advocating for the dismantling of white supremacy. So the future of feminist struggle, she says, must solidly be based on a recognition of the need to eradicate the underlying cultural bases and causes of sexism and other forms of group oppression. And we'll see two other different conceptions of oppression in the readings that follow. So if you're if you're thinking, hey, Hooks, you're not giving me a clear idea what this is, note that this is just one chapter, I believe, in a larger book. And I have supplemented uh, this notion of like, well, what is oppression? How can we fight against it in um, the Young reading and in the Fry reading as well?